car, the doctor was amazed. Everybody's been amazed. She's supposed to still be in rehab right now, doing all sorts of things. Still supposed to be in Honolulu, but God is supernaturally right. moving. Prayers have been from all around, but we want her and her mom, Butsy, to come and share about all the things that took place. And we have in front of us a miracle. And we want to glorify God through it. Ladies and gentlemen, Shiana. Um, good morning, everyone. I just want to, um, on behalf of my daughter, my husband, and our entire family, just thank you all for your prayers. Whether you said a prayer or two, or even just constantly prayed for Shiana, this is the result of prayer. Because prayer is powerful, and prayer changes everything, and, and that's how I believe from the moment I heard the news. Just a few highlights of how God has worked in this um, in this situation, which was a bad one from the beginning. Um, like Pastor Tom said, if you've seen her car, from what I understand, from the paramedics, from the policeman, and whoever was there, there was the car was totally um, smashed, and there was just like a small pocket, and that's where she was um, in. And, and they, from the get-go, uh, they didn't believe what they were, uh, what they seen and the, what they experienced. And got to Shiana to Wilcox, and there she stayed for four days before we had to medevac her out. Then um, what happened was, what was a small bruise in her lungs became something really um, uh, crucial. It, it almost... Uh, cause her life. Um, staying at uh, Madavac to Queen, stay there for about three weeks, and during that three weeks, things became really um, uh, crucial. And I can only remember that uh, through it all, when um, the doctors were saying, This is all we have, and this is the last thing we can do. I remember um, my brother said, aren't you going to listen? Aren't you going to listen to what they got to say? And at that point, I knew I had to surrender God, surrender my daughter to God. Because at that point, medicine and man, machines and everything, could not do it no more. Yeah. And um, I remember I gave up listening to the doctors. And I remember... Um, texting and calling upon every praying warrior, every church, and every person that I could tell. I remember from the get-go when this, we heard the news, I gathered my Mata family and I said, please, let's pray. Let's pray for Shiana. And I knew that from the beginning that this was not going to be uh, an easy walk or an easy test. And through it all, um, people, I just want to say that God goes where no man can. And um, I remember that day when they put her on this rotating bed and they had this jet van putting 30, 300 breaths a minute into her that, that we take 20 breaths. And it was just kind of crazy thing. She had rods on her legs and they put her on this machine. And, and, and I, I was there and I said, Lord, Lord. And I asked everyone just to pray, pray, pray for a miracle. Pray for a miracle because we need a miracle in our family today. And I, I called everyone and I texted everyone I knew and I said, please, uh, we need a miracle. We need a miracle. Because basically um, the doctor said, this is it. And she doesn't respond to this. this. This machine, this is it. And I got I took a break from everybody and I got on my phone and I text, I need a miracle, pray for a miracle, I need a miracle, pray for a miracle. And then two days, um, Shiana started breathing in two and a half days and she started to respond. And throughout this whole thing, there's been miracle after miracle after miracle. And God has had his hand upon this whole situ situation from the beginning. And she hasn't walked yet, and she has some things to do still. Her legs are still um, 
you can't see it, but her legs are full with rods on both sides. And so she's going to learn to walk. In fact, I know she's going to learn to run faster than she did. And she will dance more beautiful than she ever did before. And that's the God that I serve. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I just want to thank all of you for your prayers and for just blessing me and helping, helping my family get through this hard time. <laughs> the power of God has changed me in a dramatic way and I hope he uses me as, as an example for not only the believers but the non-believers. And I'm a miracle. There's no way I would have made it out without God in my life. So to all my aunties, you know, my my mom, my cousins who never prayed before and prayed to where they probably didn't even realize how much they were praying. It's it's unbelievable how how God just can work in somebody's life through a dramatic situation like this and use me as as like an example of what he's capable of doing and to my family I just thank you for staying there by my side my cousins my aunties my friends who flew in from Oahu it's been an amazing, amazing journey for everybody. And I, there's nobody else that I like to thank but God. He's, I can't thank him enough but just to dedicate my life to him and live through him, you know, and just have him guide my path. And just help others. Maybe I can help others. Maybe, you know, people can learn from me. But miracles do happen and that's why I'm here and just thank you all for your prayers for just touching me and my family and my life my second chance of life I'm just gonna live it through Jesus <laughs> can I um, say one more thing what was amazing was that it didn't matter who came in or what came in uh, was in and out of the room I, I would ask the doctors can you pray <laughs> Can you pray for her? Awesome. And then when a nurse would go home and, and they said, it's the end of my shift now, Marianne. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. And I, I, we didn't know if she was going to be here tomorrow. But I said, can you please pray? Can you pray that God will just touch you on his life? And then, um, so to the doctors, they were saying, when she got out of it, you're amazing. You're a miracle. And they said in the medical field, you don't say that literally and not really mean it. Her one doctor, um, who was a trauma doctor, said, you're such amazing, you're so amazing. She, she goes, you're 200% what we thought would take another three weeks, you're 200% in the first week. And she goes, you're a miracle. <laughs> and then her orthopedic doctor put in the rods, he says, he wasn't so friendly and stuff, he says, you know, your legs look good. And then he said, um, he told her, they're going to heal beautifully. And he said, you know, in my career, I'm only allowed three miracles in my career. And he said, you're the first miracle. And then he looked at her and he said, bluntly, I thought you weren't going to make it. And so over and over, we hear it from non-believers as well as believers. She is a miracle. So thank you, everyone. And Shiana, you will dance again for Jesus. <laughs> and we're going to rejoice in that day as well. Amen. Well, that's what the Lord is about. And that's what we're here about, is just the power and the might of our, our wonderful Lord and Savior. I'm blessed today to have a friend of mine here today who I love and respect and, and, and is just a guy I look to as this just has a heart who just is overflowing with the living water. And he has a word for us today. And uh, we're just going to let him share that word and be blessed by him. 
Todd White. Thanks, man. Love you, Bill. Thank you, man. So let's turn you on. Okay. I think I'm on. Am I on? Yeah, I'm good. He did it. Good. All right. Good morning. Wow. Wow. Phew. Jesus, let us never have to get to a place where you've all we've got left to realize that you've all we've really needed to begin with. <laughs> God, let us not have to go through tragedy in order to get to majesty. What happened in my life? But man, we don't have to take it like that. We can just receive it. But I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to do something with this word, God, and make it alive. Make our lives forever changed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In my short opportunity short time period, the opportunities I've had in, in to watch and what God would do in the lives of people is amazing. In my life, I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. But Jesus, He didn't save me so that I could continue living for myself. He saved me so that I could live from heaven towards earth, not towards heaven. Always from heaven towards earth. I'm supposed to live from there towards here. I'm not supposed to live from here towards there. I'm supposed to live with hope. Because hope deferred makes your heart sick. And if Christ in me is the hope of glory, then I have something to be very hopeful about. God chose me. He could have chose anybody. He did choose everyone. I just said yes. It's amazing. And the opportunities are available to watch God's majesty flow through us on a constant basis. And I see people in the room that are here that, that I know of miracles that have happened in their lives and Everywhere I travel, I get to see God's hand in stuff. And it's amazing. You know, just even with your life. I didn't even know who you were. And I was so blessed just to be able to call. Just to pray. To be a part of all y'all's prayers. Just to join it because we're the body of Christ. All of us. And just to see what was then and what is now. And to see. Oh, yeah, we got it. What a blessing it is to be able to be a part of this. Christianity, right? We... We have people that like to watch football and they like to watch all kinds of sports and I went to South Africa and they're like all into rugby and it's crazy, man, all over the earth. But Christianity is a full contact sport, man. Get in the game. Be engaged. This isn't a sidelines thing. This isn't a hang out and cheer the team on. It's you're on the team, man. It's time to run. Yeah? It really is. Here, another one. There's a a, a lady that good friends of mine, Gail and, and Keith and, and, and another, Brittany, her, her dad, they had a, a real mishap in the family and there was a, they were, they had, they were playing around and, and her dad fell down the steps and when he fell down the steps, he, he cracked his head at the bottom of the steps and his head is wide open and it's a mess and it is a major accident and he is in a, in a coma, Correct? Went into a coma. And like it, doctors are like, it is not good at all. And this man does not know God. And it is not good, especially when somebody doesn't know God. Because man, there's no hope there at all. I mean, what are we hoping for really? So he's, he's in the hospital. He's not functional. He can't, he can't, he's not responding. He's out. And my friends are at my house and, and up in Pennsylvania. And, and they, you know, we're, we're praying. And I said, come on, man, we, we're going to call. So we called the hospital. And when we called the hospital, he's there in the bed, in a coma. His wife is, is there and the, sis, the sister, sister and brother-in-law. They're in the hospital room. They don't know God. There's no Jesus in this whole realm. Although they've been walking out Jesus so that they have something to see, they haven't grabbed a hold of it. But major tragedy has hit the household, has hit the home. And so we're, we got him on the phone. I said, come on, we're going to pray. And, and gave the phone to, to the wife, right? Yeah? 
and said, we're going to pray right now. And as we're praying, the Holy Spirit entered the room. The presence of God shook the room, like literally. Like, not like, but like every heart in the room was trembling and God came in the room over a phone from people that were in faith here sending a prayer there because it's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. And I get the opportunity of seeing this on a daily basis, of seeing this all the time and watching God's hand in this. And I just believe that Christianity is not psychological. It's not the way that seems right to a man. The way that seems right to a man is contrary to the gospel. A lot of people have been hurt by the church and they've allowed the way that seems right to a man to influence the way they think about who God is when God never did that stuff to us. Jesus is amazing and he's supernatural. He's not psychological. He's awesome. Dude, what greater love, man, has this, like, love came down, was crucified, hung on a tree when we were spitting and mocking and, and yelling and whatever and beating him and whipping his flesh. Jesus is like, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Love said that on a tree. He gave us the short opportunity in this world to leave a legacy, to leave an imprint, to leave God's handprint on, on society, on, on Kauai, on Oahu, on every state, on every place I go. I get to leave God's handprint there. I get to sear it in so that people never forget the God I serve. And that's everybody's opportunity. That's our opportunity as Christians to walk fully possessed by the God of the universe that chose to come humble himself as a man and redeem his children from the muck, from the mire, from the tragedy so that he can have his home back in his kids again. This is amazing. What an opportunity. Life isn't hard. We're just so fixed and focused on what's wrong instead of what's been made right. Come on, this thing is awesome. If you're not having fun, you're not believing the right gospel. Because gospel means good news. It's really good news. It's good tidings of great joy. Man, my whole life I ran from God. And right now, I have peace with God. It's been almost nine years. And I've got the same peace that I had then. Except it's way more exciting now because I know Him more. It's not just some prayer that I pray, come to church on Sunday, and live like hell Monday through Sunday. It's not just some good service where I have goosebumps and come on a Sunday morning, walk out the door and freak out. It's the reality of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christianity was never about just getting out of here. Christianity is not about escape, escape the big bad world and the huge devil. It's about our huge God, the most amazingly huge God ever that chose to make his home inside of you. And he just wants to have his way with you. Man, it's not about like even like, man, it's about him. It's just about Jesus. So I said, we're going to pray right now. Come on. And Keith and Gail got on their face, on their knees, and we just prayed. And I'm talking to the, to the relatives, and I'm sharing the gospel. And Brittany wasn't there, Brittany. She's here right now. Hi, Brittany. This is her dad. Her dad that's hanging in the balance doesn't know Jesus. And he's not even coherent to hear the prayer. So we pray for him. And I heard in my heart, in 24 hours, he's going to come out of this thing. 24 hours. That's a real bold statement to make. Unless it's made in faith. Unless it's not, because the world thinks it's presumption. The world thinks, don't get your hopes up. But the gospel says, Christ in us is the hope of glory. The world says, well, you don't want to put your hope, you don't want to put all your money into that right there. And Jesus, because they can't see it, was, well, you know what, I can't see it. Come on, man wrote the book. We've got all these different, all these different opinions, man. And we said, well, you know, when man wrote the book, it was written by men. I mean, it was written by men. It's, you know, how do you know? I mean, men are deceived. I hear all kinds of stuff on your island, in the waters, when I'm out there, in the water talking to some, well, you know, men wrote the book, man. Come on. I mean, men make mistakes, man. Well, you know, it was, it was interpreted by men. Not, not realizing that all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is breathed and inspired by God. That Word is not just some book that you just flippantly read, memorize, and think you know it. That word is amazing. It's life. It's living and powerful. It's sharp and active. It's able to divide your, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions from your spirit, man. 
And the Word of God is alive and so many people, you know, I can't understand it when I read it. Or the hardest part is thinking that you understand it when you read it. Come on, because you think that the book's smart. I I, I got it. I read that. No, I read the whole Bible in a year. I already did that. Been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. Sorry, man. That's not how it works. I said, use the example the other night about, about these people that are locked up, man, that are, that are put in prison, and they're there for 12 years. One example was 12 years, the guy was in prison, and he had one page of the Bible. He had the book of James, just the first chapter. He's locked up for 12 years, and that's the only piece of paper that he has in there. And he lived on the Word of God for 12 years. One chapter! That's crazy! Man, I guarantee you that if anybody knew it, it was that dude that says, consider it joy when you face various trials. It's an amazing thing when you face various trials. I mean, how many times do you think he thought about that word? Consider it pure joy. And if you lack wisdom, ask God. How many times do you think he read that scripture, do you think that he thought, wow, I lack wisdom? Man, it's weird because the word confronts your mindset. It confronts the way that seems right to a man. So when I read the word, I have to choose to believe that God inspired this, he wrote this, or men interpreted it and it could be wrong and I can make up my own thing. That's just not the way it is. The word's alive. What it does is it, it plants itself, it roots itself deep into your heart. And then all of a sudden, you start to just do things and say things that aren't that aren't natural with your character because you've taken on a different character. The divine nature of Abba has come to make his home inside of you. Being born again is simple. It just means to be refathered. People say, well, born again, that's a cult. Ah, yeah, that's a cult. Man, look at the world, dude. (laughs) Christianity's a cult, but the world is cool. Ah, come on, man. Christianity's not a cult. Christianity is not the way that seems right to a man. It is the most amazing opportunity of a lifetime. But I am here for a short window of time to leave a legacy. To watch people like this recover. To watch people that don't know Jesus come to know him because they meet me and I know him. And I'm not boasting in Todd White. Trust me, man. I'm not boasting in that because I know what I was capable of. But I know what Jesus is capable of. Because if he can touch me and scramble my eggs. I'm telling you, I had a lot of rotten ones. And he turned it into something completely different. This isn't just a second chance. This is a new life. I promise you. People are going to be so affected by your life. No one's going to be able to deny Jesus is real. Your whole family is going to be overwhelmed with the gospel. Doesn't matter where they are. I promise you. Doesn't matter. Brothers are going to be overtaken by the gospel. I know you're here. You're not getting out of this. I promise. And I'm not just popping off being Mr. Cool Guy. I'm telling you the truth. Because Jesus is real. I feel I need to apologize even know where they are. I feel like they're here. But I, but I know I need to apologize to them for what they've seen in the church. Because they ain't happy with what they've seen. Jesus is different. And he's shining for you. You will see your whole family come to him. Because it's not just about meeting inside of a building. It's about carrying and housing the presence of God and becoming the very temple of God. Man, God wants to dwell in us, move in us, and have our being in us because He loves us and He's overwhelmed with even the the fact that we would say, well, maybe. Well, maybe. Man, just give Him the well, maybe once. He will, He will get you. Awesome. Jesus, thank you. Great grace, God. Let me finish this testimony. I have somewhere I want to share with you and I'm not doing good on time. The time do I got to be done? No. Usually. It's not good. Whenever I start smelling pizza, that's when I'll be done, bro. (laughs) The bomb. 
we prayed on that phone. And I shared the gospel. I shared the gospel of the kingdom. I, not that I'm any better preacher than anybody else. It's not our preaching that does it. It's the Holy Spirit. That the anointing of God upon the word that makes it alive. Otherwise, it's just words. Without the Holy Spirit, it's just a book. Without, without Him interpreting the book, you'll think that whatever interpretation you get that you think of with your mind is right. And you will live according to the way that seems right to a man. And you incorporate the Bible into your mind instead of bringing it into your heart. And you will think that you've got your mind transformed through memorization instead of walking out what the Word said is true. I promise, man, if God can touch me, He can touch anyone. I'm looking around this room. I'm watching, I'm looking what God has touched and it's pretty amazing, man. Really. Come on, because how many of us be real sorry without Him, man? Real sorry without Him. The problem is, is sometimes we think we can live without Him and do things without Him. Holy Spirit really wants to be involved in our whole day. He does. So we're sitting there, we're praying on the phone, and I think I was talking to, I was talking to Barb. Who was I talking to? Barb. And I said, just put your hand, and, and then we talked to, to Glenn, another one of the relatives, and I don't know what I feel right now. Something's going on right now. I said, it's him. He goes, Oh my gosh, what is this? I said, it's him, it's his goodness, it's him. He loves you so much. Wow! What was really, really awesome is that her family in that room got born again. In the midst of tragedy. I'm talking like horrific stuff. And Jesus is like, ah, not guilty. Bang. See, what we think that our life, and sometimes our life is so much, and we have so much trash, so much stuff, that Jesus isn't capable. Or we think, when we look in the mirror and we see the stuff that we did, we see the junk that we've done, or we see the things that, that we've caused in our life, we think that Jesus like, is just some kind of fairy tale. Like, it's too good to be true. There, there's no way. It's too good to be true. God's so good because He is true. It's not too good to be true. He's so good He is true. And he so is in love with us and so just wants us to believe that the cross is the reality of the gospel. The finished work. Man, with my junk and my life and the tragedy that I caused, I should be dead. I, I should be dead. But Jesus said, not guilty. Bang. What do you mean? All that stuff. What he did when he said not guilty is he wiped out who I was so that I could walk in who he is. How crazy is this? That Jesus would take my whole life and who I was and all my junk and all the stuff I wish I'd never did and I did a lot of very, very horrible things. That Jesus would take all that and go, wash it away where old things literally passed away. Where literally all things become new. Well, I don't feel like they're new. That's the problem. We don't feel like, so we live by feelings instead of walk by faith. All of a sudden, our feelings catapult us into a dark pit. And then we're in that dark pit wondering why I have to ask God to forgive. Or God, please forgive. I thought you forgave me. I thought this. And all these people keep bringing up this stuff. And you're so biting the bait of the liar, of the thief, of the enemy, that we can't even get to what God's called us to. And that's just to become love. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He's the visible image of what love looked like. He's the express image of the Father. When you see Jesus, John 14, Philip and all those guys, they're, they're with Jesus and Jesus is like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Because they're like, well, how are we going to know the way to get there? Jesus is like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I'm the way to heaven. Although that's what he means. The initial point of the way is the way to the Father. The end point of a Christian life lived is going into glory. The end point is getting to heaven. But if you make your end point your beginning point, you'll be seeking to get rescued out of here your whole life instead of realizing why God left you here. He didn't rescue you and save you so that you could pray for him to get you out of the big bad world and escape the big bad devil. I'm not kidding. Jesus prayed. He said in the Lord's Prayer in John 17, 
Jesus prayed. He's talking about the disciples. He goes, Lord, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. But I pray that you'd protect them from the evil one. Divine protection. Not from out here, but living in here. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Are you guys okay? A little? Like ADD in the spirit. Because it's the word that changes things. So I'm sitting there, we're praying. The next morning, guess what happened? He woke up. Ooh, that's pretty amazing. So we said, well, that was bold. What if it didn't happen? What if, what if, what if I have faith enough for it to happen? What if you, there were songs we're singing up there, the mountains and all that. What if, what if we just believe God? So we, have, we side so much on the what if it doesn't happen that we don't even have faith for what if it could happen. Come on, man, so many things we've, we've pressed into and not seen it. But without faith, it's impossible. Please, God. And God wants us to be a people that walk in faith, that trust Him. Did I lose you? Are you okay? You water walkers or what? I'm honestly, I am not here to like tip your boat, rock your boat, flip your boat. I'm here to take your boat. I'm serious, so that you're like, oh no! Well, we better trust. So I, I, we said in that prayer, we were praying together. I said, I, I, hear, I hear God say, zero side effects, no lingering side effects of this thing at all. That's a bigger word to speak. Right? That's cool. Guess what? How long has it been? Thanksgiving. Zero side effects. Now. The only thing, the only thing I think is he's a little tired. A little tired after work. But other than that, all the stuff the doctor said, no way. Jesus said, yes way. So, huh? So here, so I'm just going to pray the same thing. Because when I came up to you today, what, I, what did I tell you? I said, I really see no side effects. I see this thing. And what did I say about the metal? I said that we're seeing, I know there's some really stretched people. But we're seeing God take metal out of bodies. As crazy as it sounds, it's happening. We've watched people go back in. They go through the metal detectors. The first time we saw it, we had a nine-year-old girl pray for a lady that had a wire mesh knee. Nine-year-old. It's a little kid. We had her pray. Prayed to lay hands. The lady could squat down, and she's moving around, and she's never seen anything like that. So she calls her doctor in Florida and says to him, I, I, need, you to, I need you to do an x-ray. She lives in Pennsylvania. He goes, what do you mean? She goes, I can bend, and I can't feel the screws anymore. So she's like, and I went through the metal detector and I didn't set it off. I know that's a crazy stretch. Listen, that's a stretch, yet you say that you believe that Jesus, like God breathed into dirt and it jumped up a man. Which is more of a stretch? Come on, man. For real. Jesus, we, we say we believe the gospel. We say we believe creation. God breathed into dirt and it jumped up a man. He's like, ah, hi, dad. But when I say stuff like that, I'm like, well, I don't know about that. Because we've, we've become prone to the way that seems right to a man. And we've based our faith on what we can see in the reality of this world more than the reality of heaven invading this world. Yes? I'm just stretching you, man. I want to be stretched every day. I never, ever, ever want to be like I was yesterday. I want to grow. I want to grow more. I want to know Him more. I want to seek Him more. I want to worship Him more. I want to be more thankful today than I was yesterday, if it's possible. I want to. I want to see more people come to Him. More people come to Him. Not because I've talked them into it, manipulated them into it, gone for their juggler vein to get them to pray my prayer into it. But I want to see them see my life, see people's lives that Jesus has touched and be so overwhelmed by their walk that they say, I have to have what you have because the gospel talks about it. The gospel says that's what's supposed to happen. People are supposed to see our lives. It says, walk worthy of the calling. That's what it says. Walk worthy of the call. Shine. And in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation, it says, among whom you shine as lights in this world. Man, there is perception of what light is. But God
God says he's placed himself inside of you. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Then he said, you're the light of the world. That's a crazy thing. You're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. You're the light that lights up your own house. Don't dare have a lampshade on your head. Believe the gospel and walk in the brightness of his glory and see people for their created value and dare to trust God. That's all he's asking us for. It's trusting God. Man, it's awesome. I was in a hospital. Another testimony. In a hospital. I was there on an outreach. We were there to pray for somebody that had uh, something. I don't remember exactly what it was. Sorry, I go to a hospital all the time to pray for people. So we're there to pray for somebody. And I was sitting on the lobby and there's this kid sitting there on the, on the floor, on the iPhone, like lots of kids do. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, hey, what's going on with you guys? I walk past them. Like, oh, we're, we're, just, we're just waiting. And I said, what are you waiting for? Love it. Because I'm there to pray for somebody, but everybody in that hospital is in need. And if I dare not to be so concerned about my time schedule, like 10.30 is coming right now. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> no pizza for me. I'm fasting today. Courtesy of Tom. Pastor Tommy Anucci. Awesome people. So I, I'm, I'm talking to him and I said, what's going on? Oh, we're, we're here to pray for my dad. So what happened? Oh, he, he, he had a heroin overdose. The doctor says he's not going to make it. I said, you're kidding me. She goes, she goes, no. She goes, and I started crying. I said, oh my gosh. I said, well, I'm here praying for somebody. And I can't get into their room. Can we get into yours? And she's like, well, you know, if, if, if you really want to pray for him, she goes, he's really a mess. It's like really bad. I said, that does. Jesus, I shared my testimony about being a drug addict for 22 years, an atheist my whole life, and how Jesus came into my life and changed everything. She's like, okay. Let's go. <laughs> really? And on the way down, I have a word about her friend that is with her that he damaged the right side of his back on the back of his um, shoulder blade. He goes, yeah, but let's go. Let's go pray for him because he's more important. I said, I get it. I put my hand on his back. I said, come on, let's do it. Jesus, thank you. And we prayed on the way. Jesus heals his shoulder blade. He's like, what's going on? I said, man, he's real. He goes, dude, you're for real. Because he wasn't even a Christian. He was using the lingo. He was using the lingo. But he became one right there. Why? Because of an encounter with God. Just a touch from heaven. Just a touch from heaven. Guys, you've got God living inside of you. You can touch people and have heaven flow through you and touch lives around you. We don't, we don't need any more excuses of why we can't. We don't. We just need to have the reality of trust in our Father and how much He loves us. So, we went to this hospital room. And this guy's all slobbering and he's, he's, he's OD. Done. Doctor said his brain's baked. Finished. For real. We're on an outreach at a conference. Totally different. I have this girl lay hands on her father. She's shaking and trembling because she can't look at her father because of all the mess that he's created in her life. She's just there. He's on his way out. And honestly, when I talked to her at first in the hallway, she was like, he's going to die. Almost like he deserves to. Promise. Because of all the horrible stuff that this guy had done in her life. And I was that guy. Because that's how my life was. But if God can touch me, he can definitely touch him. So we just prayed over this guy. We didn't see any change at all. Next day, we're at the conference. This girl... Found out it was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. This girl found out where our conference was. I don't even know how it happened. Because we were just at the hospital in Lancaster. Lancaster's a big city. Like, big. So she shows up at the conference. She comes up. It's the evening service. She comes up. She's in our line of testimony. We have people come up and share testimony. It's an outreach conference. So we have people come up and share testimony. Line and testimony. She's in the line. And I'm like, that's that girl from the hospital. She doesn't know any better. She doesn't know any Christian language. None of that stuff. She's up front. She gets to the mic. She goes, I just want to say. She's like a public speaker now, dude. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. I just want to say. She's like walking around. I just want to say something. Where are you? She said. And I'm trying to hide. Because I know. Because it ain't. Listen. This is not about Todd White. 
I'm a Christian. I'm just a believer. This is the privilege of every believer. You don't have to have the office of a pastor, the office of an evangelist, the office of a prophet, which a lot of us don't believe exists. We don't have to have those offices to be a believer. You're a believer and the Christ, Christ in you, you are a Christian. A little anointed one with the ability to anoint. Romans 8, 11 says, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The same one, he's in you. What are you doing with him? Are we hanging out with him? Are we just letting life crush us and smash us? Come on, man. What are we living for? Jesus is amazing. He paid more of a price than just to get us to go to church on Sunday and have a complaint session the whole way through the week on how bad things are. To dispute and argue in and amongst ourselves. Jesus paid a price to make us glorious. To make us incredible. To make us walking temples of the living God. Where the Holy Spirit dwells in and has His way in. Where we walk and we become ambassadors of hope. And everywhere we go, people look at us and say, I want what that guy has. Come on, it's for real. It's the real one. The one that we have in our book, all of us. So this guy, this lady comes up, she goes, so, this guy right here, she found me, she goes, you came into the hospital. She doesn't know any better. She says, you're an angel. She doesn't know. She doesn't ha have the understanding. She's not a Christian. Yet, you, you're an angel. God sent you to our hospital room. You were there for somebody else, but you came in, and my dad woke up today. Dude, that's nuts. Crazy. His brains became unscrambled. God completely honed it in. Guys, come on. Dare to take a leap of faith. And trust God. Don't allow what you haven't seen to influence what you need to see. Don't allow what, what people say isn't true. To influence the reality of your relationship with the spirit of truth. Don't allow that stuff to hit you. Christianity is supernatural or it's not. It either is or it's not. There is no way that I'd be standing before you. None. So many people have so many problems with people that have hurt them. And this and that and the other thing. They're like, well you know what? They shouldn't have done that. They're going to get what they deserve. Well if you want what you deserve, go to hell. <laughs> It's the truth. If you want what you deserve, go to hell because none of this is, is received by your works. It's all a work of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did is enough to pay the price. Let go of your attitudes and just run after Jesus, man. I'm not telling you that people do the right things all the time. But it would be wrong for you to be mad about what they did wrong because you're no more right about them being wrong. You're actually wrong about them being wrong. And what I mean by that is this. We get upset. We get hurt by people. We're like, well, they should have known better. Okay, well, that's true. But shouldn't you have known better by what they should have known better too? Should you have known better than to be hurt by what they should have known better not to do? Which one's better? Dude, our attitudes and issues need to drop to the ground because heaven paid a high price to redeem you. Come on. Well, you know what? I don't know, because I don't know if I'm worth it. Jeez. It's one of the number one killers in the body of Christ, man. We listen to the enemy tell us that we're not worth it. But the truth is, in the world, if I were to sell you something, the price that you pay for what I sell you determines the value of whatever it is that you bought. In other words, if you were to buy a house that was worth a million five, but someone asked you, I want... I, I would like you to give me nine million for this house. You would say, sorry. Hopefully you would. Well, uh, here's a car. Look, I know you're in hard, you're in hard times. You, this car is worth a thousand, but I, I need you to give me twelve for it. Be like, are you nuts? Yet we sell so cheap. If heaven paid such a high price to get you back, that's what determines your value. Jesus paid such a high price to redeem you. That's the value that you have before the Father. If you see that, you look in the mirror and be like, oh my gosh, I have value. Not to take your value and put it up here. But you would say, God had so much purpose when He paid the price for me. He redeemed me back to the place I was as if I never ate the tree, as if I never sinned. And God loves me that much. He would send His Son to pay a price to come and live in me so He could have His way in me. 
This is awesome. You guys okay? I know? Alright. I'm going to start preaching now, bro. Just to warm up. Just kidding. But I, I do want to hit something real quick, okay? I won't keep you here. And I want to pray. Alright? You guys okay? You getting anything out of this at all? Besides like... Besides sweaty... And, and like... I hope to like provoke your heart in such a way that you're like, oh my gosh. Because this gospel should make you hungrier. Shouldn't make us think that we're full all the time and we don't need anything. So many times where I know it, when you don't know it, they have become it. The word's not like that. You don't just quote the word, memorize the word, and know the word. The only way you know the word is when you become what this word says. Amen? One scripture, one set here. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. He says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. With me, And it says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Awesome. He said, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. But I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you... As a chaste virgin to Christ. That word there, that chaste virgin to Christ, means, to me, means this. I've betrothed you to one husband. I have, I have given you to Jesus as a chaste virgin. One that has never been with the world before. One that is clean and unspotted by the world. One that has a conscience that's clean and washed by blood. One that is completely free from who they were. So that you can dare to be a son or a daughter for what God paid a price for you to be. So that when you come into this thing, you just say, forgiven. And never to bring that stuff back up again. Regret produces death, but godly sorrow leadeth to the repentance. Godly sorrow is, God, I wish I never did that. Thank God the gospel says it wasn't me that did it. And you run forward and you believe the finished work of the cross. But it says this, But I fear... Lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in the Christ. He says the same way that Eve, that Eve was deceived by the serpent. So how did the serpent deceive Eve? God, God created man in his image. Yeah. And, and when he created man in his likeness, God told them, all these tree, all the fruit of all this is yours, but there's one. So, so think of this. The life of man in the beginning had one commandment. Like, just one. Like, not 613 and 10, not even two, just one. Don't eat this tree, period. Don't do it. Everything else, it's on. It's yours. I mean, I think of Adam and Eve, I think of the beginning, and I think of just the brains. Like, I, I have trouble sometimes remembering names of people. Adam had the privilege of naming every animal. That had to be crazy, man. That's like godly wisdom. That's nuts. Remembering it, like naming it and remembering it. If you get up and run right now, I will freak. <laughs> I'm really serious. I, we've seen it. That's nuts, man. I guarantee you, every one of you would freak. Freak. Or if the metal rods were laying on the floor beside her leg, you would freak. Man. I've seen this stuff I'm talking about. I'm not just popping off, man. It's real. You can't talk me out of it. It's the simplicity that's in the Christ. It's not technical. It's not, well, you know, I've been through that, but let's use wisdom. That's not godly wisdom. Be careful about how you tone the gospel down. Be careful about how you water this thing down. Be careful about how you protect people to not get their hopes up when the gospel says to get your hopes way up. It says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that I haven't seen. That's crazy. That's not how we think. Faith in our lives, a lot of times, faith is the things that we've seen happen. 
Faith is the substance of things that we hope for. The evidence of things we haven't seen. So the simplicity that's in the Christ is the bare bones of the gospel. Man, the disciples, when they walked in the beginning of this thing, do you think how much of their life would exist without Holy Spirit? Come on, man, in the book of Acts, the disciples and how they walked and how they functioned. How much, how much of the disciples' lives would have worked without Holy Spirit? Be a hard time. You've got Thomas. He's the doubter, right? Doubting Thomas has an encounter with God. Do you know that when Thomas was killed, do you know that they peeled his skin from his whole body? They filleted him. And he wouldn't deny the Christ, man. You ain't good. He's doubting Thomas that has an encounter with the living God. That they fillet him. And he dies saying he's real. He's real. And they peeled his skin from his body. Man, I... These people have encounters with the King. They believe in the supernatural God of the universe that has come to redeem them and live inside of them. I hear this. I remember this story about this guy. He's, <clears throat> he's martyred. Right? But he's there. They're in line to be burned at the stake. And this one guy behind him, behind him is like, listen, he goes, uh, if the grace of this is really as real as everybody says, give me a sign. Do something when you're up there. Because he's going to be burnt before the guy behind him. They're headed to be burned at the stake. And this guy is up on the cross. He says, just give me a sign, man, so that I know. And this guy's flesh is burning off his body. As black as black can be. Peeling off his face. And right before he dies, he lifts his hands. On a burning tree. Lifts his hands. The ropes have burned off of his hands. He lifts his arms. And he worships Jesus. And he praises Jesus with skin missing off his face. Before another one so that he would know that the grace is real. And we get so weirded out when we don't see the things that we want to see. Trust God. The simplicity of the gospel. Now I'm really going to preach. Just kidding. I just want to read something to you. I'm going to read Ephesians 5. And I just want you to hear me. Ephesians is an amazing book. But it says in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God. What does that mean? Be an imitator of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice for God. To God for a sweet smelling aroma. It says, but fornication and all uncleanliness and uncovetedness is not even to be named among you as fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness or foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. This is hard stuff, dude. <clears throat> it says, neither filthiness nor foolish... Oh, let, me, let me read that again. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words... For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, don't be partakers with them. It's talking about the transformation in a Christian life. And it's not through legalism. And it's not through me trying to tell you this word banging on your head. And trying to make you conform to what this word says. That's not how it happens. It's the simplicity that's in the Christ. Where the Holy Spirit actually has dominion. Sets up residence inside of your heart. Makes the word that is on this on these pages come alive and inspires your brain how to think different, transforms your life. You walk the gospel out and all of a sudden the things that you used to be partakers of is not even a part of your life because it becomes distasteful because you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. <laughs> Listen to this. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. This is awesome. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what's acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. 
For it's shameful even to think about these things that are done in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, and for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See that you walk circumspectively, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always to all things, for all things through God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. It says, For you were once darkness, and this is the word that I had today. That I, really, when I, and I usually don't get it before the service, but man, tonight, today when I was worshiping, I was on my knees and kept speaking the same thing to me. It says, we were once darkness, but now we're light. So it talks about fornication and all that stuff. People get so like edgy and weird. Weird when you speak that stuff in church, they're like, oh man, come on, man, it's legalism. It's not legalism. It's a love relationship with God. Legalism can't stop you from doing any of this stuff. It's a love for the Father. It's a fear of God. It's a worshiping of the Almighty Creator that chose to live in you. And He is not okay with sharing you with the world. He's a jealous God. Right? So it says this. It says, you were once darkness, but now you are light. That means that when I was in the world, my whole life was completely dark. It was twisted. It was dark. It was yuck. But when I came to Jesus, I am now light. I was darkness. It says it. I was darkness. And now I am light. Right before that, it says, be an imitator of God. How can you be an imitator of God and an imitator of the world? You can't. That's why Jesus' number one rebuke was hypocrisy. It was hypocrisy. When I came into this, to this, to this gospel, F5, are you good? It was real important, man. When I came into this gospel, came out of 22 years of hardcore addiction. A lot of you have heard my testimony. I've shared it a billion times. As it helps. <laughs> helps me always remember where I came out of. Always. That's what we can never allow is because Christianity is so good. You can never forget where you came out of or you'll lose track on the reality of how you got here. So I was, I was in the world and I was really, 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 I had a band, I was jamming and, and we were like pretty good. And I had, this, I had all these guys, you know, I twisted stuff. The end of 22 years, I <clears throat> was just whacked. And I was suicidal, my girlfriend was leaving and taking my daughter and just a, a whack time. So I ended up going to be, going to go cap myself, be, just be done. I went to the gun cabinet to get a, pistol, to get a rifle, actually, to shoot myself. Wrote, I was going to write a note, and I looked at a phone book, flipped it open, made a check at one of the churches, went to this church. I met somebody that told me who I really was instead of why I was so messed up. So, like, I incorporated Jesus into my life. I didn't just surrender everything. I just said, all right, whatever. Anything's better than where my life is. So I went home and I called my girlfriend. Called my girlfriend. She didn't answer, but my daughter did. And I said, uh, I said, tell mommy that daddy found God. And my daughter was like, what's he like? I mean, it's tragic, man. My, the life that I created. And she talk, I said, you make sure you talk mommy into coming home. Don't let mommy get out of this. You make sure you talk her into getting home. So she came home and mommy's an atheist. He's very angry. I was a very angry person. Manipulated, dominated. Just horrible. So, my daughter came home. My girlfriend came home. Called me a hypocrite. I said, no, things are going to be different. I'm like, ah, that first night I'm out on a binge. First night. Crack binge. So I have these guys that I'm in a band with. I'm, I have a rocking band. Like, it was the only thing I really had going for me. And we would play out. Um, and, and we had all original stuff. And it was, it was that hard stuff. And I loved it. I was like, yeah. And the guys come over to band practice. And in my basement... In the, the single wide trailer we lived in, we had this like, we call it the dungeon. It was this little band room that was off the floor. It was waterlogged and carpets on the ceiling and red light, yellow light, green light, spotlights down there. Make it really cool. The guys come over, you know, and 
I had had like this experience where I asked Jesus to have my life, but I had no idea what I'd given myself to. See, Jesus never asked you to pray some prayer and invite him into your heart. If you invite him just into your heart, you'll hold back your life from him, and that's a problem. When you come to God, you give him your life. My life's not mine anymore, it's yours. Here it is. You can do something with it, here it is. And man, you just give God that opportunity one time. Watch what he does. See, we think that when Jesus comes in, he just puts up some wallpaper. Oh, no. He knocks out the walls, man. <laughs> it's like Jesus coming into the temple with a three-strand cord. Wow, wow, wow. Flipping the table. Really? So I told the guys at band practice, they came in. I'm like, dude, you guys aren't going to believe this, right? Trust me, they didn't. I said, man, I said, dude, I gave my life to Jesus, right? And the band members are like, dude, shut the blank up. I'm like, serious, man. Music is going to change, man. They're like, what do you mean change, dude? I mean, we had a CD out. It was like, it was crazy. So all the guys were like, dude, just chill. I'm like, I'm not chilling, man. You don't understand. Jesus is real. I don't know him, but I'm gonna. And I met somebody that did. The guys were like, listen, if you don't back off, we're out. So my band members like, mm -mm -mm. that night took their stuff out. See ya. So one guy hung around. His name's Bobby. He's like my best friend in the whole world. Right? I mean, like, awesome. And so Bobby's like, he's like, he's a virtuoso, virtuoso, yeah, virtuoso. He's a musician. He's like, he's a stay-at-home daddy. He has two kids. He has a wife. And uh, he, he, they don't have many bills. They only have, like, electric utility bill. His wife works. And he's home with the kids. He's got three-year-old, five-year-old, or no, three, yeah, three-year-old, seven-year-old. Sorry. And so it's like, it's, he's, got, he's got it made. And so Bobby's like, dude, I don't believe in this Jesus thing. You need to chill out. But I believe in you. So I'm like, I'm like, oh, dude, cool. So you're going to stay? He's like, yeah. I said, dude, we're going to make a new band. We're going to make different music. He's like, man, I'm just chill. I, believe, I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in you. So we're like, he's like, oh, yeah, he's just a good guy. Like, I mean a good guy. No Jesus, no Christianity. And there was nobody in his life to bring the gospel into his life. And so I have this opportunity of a lifetime. And so for five, honey, don't leave. <laughs> so I have this, so that's my wife. So I have this opportunity of a lifetime to pour into this guy, to give him the gospel. And so he would come over to my house, we would jam, I would be upstairs screaming at my girlfriend, yelling at my daughter, come downstairs, walk into the band room, we're like, hey man, how you doing man? Jesus loves you. What's up? He'd be like, oh hey, come on man, really, back off man. And there was no solid anything because I didn't have a voice to speak. Because how can I have a voice to speak in hypocrisy? There's no voice. So he's like, he's jamming with me. And he would come over on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we would party. We would get high. We would get plastered. And I would tell him about Jesus. And Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. And he, some, some Thursdays, that was like later in the week, I'd be out on a crack bench so I wouldn't show up at band practice. He'd be at my house jamming and I would never come. But he would always come back because he believed in me. This is a good friend, man. My best friend. And so, about five and a half months into my life, I, I went out one night and I picked up that kid uh, in that, it was a drug frenzy, man. I was just hooked on coke. Picked up some kid and that night my, my girlfriend and my daughter followed me out in town. I picked up this kid after I lost them. I picked up some kid, got him in my car, told him I was a cop, read him his rights after I had the drugs in my hand. Told him to step out of the car, put his hands on the hood. And when he did, I hit the gas. And at that very moment, he unloaded a 9mm at me from 10 feet away. And it was like... <laughs> and a voice at that very time said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? So watch. Remember when I said at the beginning about getting to the place of tragedy. To realize that Jesus is all we ever needed to begin with. That happened in my life. I'm not just speaking that because I heard a testimony of horrible stuff and I'm going to live for Jesus. I think it's awesome. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be cool if we didn't have to get to that? Right? So I'm, I'm, I go, I drive my car, I, the bullets are fresh 
in my ears, but that voice that's inside my head won't go away. I took those bullets for you. Are you ready yet? I took them. Are you ready? And I am like freaking out, man. So I try to get high to make the voice go away, and the voice won't go away, and I can't get high. And I, I smoked a quarter ounce of crack that night and couldn't even get high all night long. And that night I went home, and my girlfriend was up. I hate you. Ah, yes. My daughter, no, daddy, and I left. And I decided to go to a place called Teen Challenge, Christian Rehab, kind of like you turn. So I, I was going in three days, so I called Bobby, my friend, and I said, dude, I said, you're not going to believe this, man, but last night I was out in a drug deal, and, and I got shot at, man, and he goes, oh, are you okay, man? I'm going, no, man, I'm not okay, because God in his mercy, and I, he said, stop. He said, the guy was a bad shot, man. I go, Bobby, it wasn't a bad shot. Like, it was real. Like, he was right there in the back of my car. There's no holes in my whole vehicle, man. Ten feet away. A voice said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? And I said, dude, I, I haven't been living for him. He goes, how can you live for somebody that doesn't exist? And I'm like, man, I'm telling you, dude. I go, listen, I made a decision. I'm going to Teen Challenge. It's like a rehab. He goes, oh, good for you, man. You're going to get some help. So in three days, I'm, two days from there, I'm going. I said, can we get together tomorrow and just hang out? Because I'm not going to be able to see you until I get out. He goes, no, man, we'll see each other in a month. Because most rehabs are 28 days. The teen challenge is 12 months. So I told him, he goes, oh, dude, why are you going to do that for a year? Well, you don't need a year. Listen, Jesus isn't, come on, trying to talk me out of this. See, I got shot at. See, God had mercy on me. No way to talk me out of this. So I said, I got to go, man. I'm going. He goes, well, there's no way I can get together with you. He goes, listen, I'll be here when you get back. I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in you, man. And I said, dude. I said, I'm telling you, man. He's real. That's cool, man. He goes, I'll, I'll talk to you. Okay, I got to go. I got some stuff to do. So, the next day when I'm leaving the Teen Challenge, I call up to his house, say goodbye. And, and he didn't answer the phone. My girlfriend at this point is glad to get rid of me. He's like... God, if you're real, take him out of my life. Really, that was the last day. Like, so I'm on my way to Teen Challenge. I call the house right before I leave. He doesn't answer the phone. I leave the message on his answering machine. I go to Teen Challenge. My girlfriend's glad to get rid of me. My daughter is very sad because I'm leaving. I'm up there. Three days later, I get this phone call. And it's my pastor from my church, the guy that was helping me, Dan. He's my spiritual father. He calls me and he says, Todd, I need you to... Listen, the counselors brought me in the room and like, your pastor's on the phone. Todd, sit down. I'm like, oh, dude, what is going on? Like, I don't need anything right now. I submitted to God. I've given myself to God. I, I don't need this. So I said, what happened to Jackie? What happened to Destiny, my daughter, my girlfriend? He said, it's not them. He said, it's Bobby. I said, what happened? He goes, Bobby had a brain aneurysm. I'm like, what's that? He said, Bobby's in a coma. The doctors don't expect him to live through the night. And I'm like, Oh my God, kidding me. And I just freak out. I have no idea about healing. I don't understand anything at all. All I know is that I'm lost, man. I'm lost. And I'm freaking. I'm like, oh, gotta get out of here. So I run around the corner, up the stairs, go to the prayer room just to be alone. I just want to be by myself. And I run back here. I shut the door. The door doesn't shut behind me. Someone's coming in there with me. Not a good place because I'm a fighter. I grew up scrapping. I grew up that. I just grew up that way. And this guy comes up. He's behind me. And he's like, he's not there to comfort me. He's up there to rouse me. He's up there to like poke me. And this is not a time to be poked man, at all. I mean, I grew up in a boy's home. I, I grew up hard, man. This guy's like, he's in there and he goes, what's up, man? I go, dude, I said, please just leave me alone, man, right now. He goes, I'm not leaving you alone. What's up? He goes, whatever it is, it's not that bad. And he gets in my face. And I... I was so angry. I was so mad. I had rage. Like, all my holes in, all my doors at home had holes in them. I'd broken my fists on, just stuff, my junk. And I went and I, I said, no! I screamed and the God of peace answered me in that horrible place that I was at and dropped me to my knees and threw this guy back into the couch, literally, in the room. And it was like, something hit me. And I heard God say to me, you're not going anywhere. And I just, boom, it was settled. I didn't go anywhere at all. 
So I'm in there, and this guy and I, we became like really good friends. Like this guy, Micah, this guy in the, there we are, I'm there again. This guy, Micah, and I became really good friends. And, and, and two months later, I had this radical encounter with Jesus, and two months into the program, and like the thing with Bobby, like it, it, like it left me. And he was my best friend. It left me just because I needed to be there. So two months later, I have these three dreams where I have encounters with Jesus. I leave the program ten months early. I had these three dreams where I actually encountered Jesus. And the fruit in my life bear witness that what I'm telling you is true. That's all. So I go home. First thing I have to do is go tell my daughter how sorry I am for the mess I've created in her life and how much tragedy my life brought. And so we went home to say I was sorry. My daughter comes running across the porch and I said, I just want to tell you how much daddy's sorry and how much I love you and how much I'm going to be a father now. <laughs> and my daughter goes... What happened, Daddy? And I go, I met Jesus. She goes, I know, but what are you talking about? Like all the mess that I created in her life. It was completely gone. She didn't remember any of it. See, we say that's not possible. But Jesus, the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works. In order to serve God. Get an encounter with righteousness. So my girlfriend comes out of the house. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. She looks at me. She says, I know you are. I gave my life to God when you were in there. My girlfriend... And I said, I cannot live here. Because I know that I'm not going to enter into that thing again. It's not going to happen. I'm clean in my heart. For the first time in my life, I'm clean. I'm not about to damage it. She looks at me. She goes, I know. We need to get married. And she asked me to marry. And we got married four days later. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. That's the one that walked out on my meeting a couple minutes ago. Right there. <laughs> so, the day we got married... I heard in my heart to go and see Bobby. Bobby was up in the Brethren home. He was on a, in a coma. He was up there on life support. And I went up there and I said to him, I, I walked into the room and I brought Destiny with me. She's 16 now. I brought Destiny with me and, and she comes into the room and she sees the guy that she knew that is in the bed with, with his skull cut away and his brain bulging out to here. I still don't understand about healing or none of that stuff. All I know I was lost, but now I'm found. And I looked into his eyes, and he wasn't home, and he's my best friend. And I thought, when I walked in there, because Betty, his wife's in the corner, I looked at Bobby and I said, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. See, see, we get all wrapped up in our life and how bad things are, and we got to medicate, or we do this, do this to get through life. There are people's lives that are at stake, man. So Bobby, my best friend, is looking at me, but he's not looking at me. And I said how sorry I was. And he couldn't answer me. He, couldn't, he didn't grab my hair and he just wink his eye. None of that stuff. He's dead stare, comatose. And I said, I'm so sorry, man. His wife looks at me. She goes, for what? I said, because I didn't walk out what Jesus paid a price for me to walk out. She goes, Jesus? You're going to tell me about Jesus. Look at him. And I'm just like, I'm sorry. Shut up. Don't tell me you're sorry. And she walked away. And I sat there. My daughter, Destiny, sitting there. And I looked at her and I said, I'm sorry. She's like crying. Old Bobby just praying. God, thank you for Bobby's life. Thank you. Bobby, I'm sorry. If you can hear me, man, I'm sorry. So many times we got this, life's all about me. We forget. And you have a short time period to leave a legacy. What God can do in a life. Your life was one dark, but now is light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. Walk worthy of the calling. You don't have to. You get to. And Bobby, the next day, he died. My best friend. Man, that hurt my heart. And my wife and I held each other and we prayed. God. Let his kids know you. Because I, because they called me the next day. The mom, the, the wife called me. She said, you were Bobby's only friend. We want you to speak at his funeral. So I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. This is like horrible. Like in my, I'm like, what am I going to say? I was a total hypocrite. And I was the only one. I was the only one that could bear witness in Bobby's life of what truth looked like. But I didn't know. So I didn't walk it out. 
So in the midst of me not knowing and not walking it out, Bobby dies and I'm the only one that has this place in his life. I don't believe in him, but I believe in you. That's horrible, man. So I get up there. Bobby's in the casket. His shell is there. He's not home, man. He's not there. He's somewhere and his kids are in the front row. I had to look at his kids and I had to say, I don't know where your daddy is right now. That's the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I promise you this. I will never, ever, ever have to do that again. Because I've given my life to this gospel. This is not Jesus Incorporated. And you guys have bobbies in your life. This is not a game. This is the reality of the gospel. The danger of hypocrisy is this. There are people that are watching you. And if they can't see Christ in you. They don't want what you have. They don't want to hear what you have to say. If they can't see what love looks like, they don't want it, man. Jesus isn't the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to heaven except by Him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. And this is a relationship to where your children of God, who is the light of the world, and you are children of that light. And God has given you the short window of opportunity in your life to be able to represent what light looks like, what light talks like, what light looks like. Everywhere you go, you can shine with the brightness of His glory. And all it takes is a heart that says, you know what, God? I want this. I want this. God, the miracles are a part of it. The miracles are amazing, supernatural. But all of it is supernatural. There's no way for you to do this without Him. Ever. I love the fact that she's out of the hospital. I love it. I love that I get to see people wake out of comas. I love it. That one I didn't. And I had an opportunity to pour Jesus into His life. And I did. And I had to preach at that funeral. And they asked me what I'm going to preach about. I said what it means to be a friend. So this is, what it, this is how it went. I said a friend is somebody that walks out what he believes in front of his other friend, even if his other friend doesn't believe what he believes. A friend is somebody that if he says he believes in God, he walks out the belief in God, regardless of what his other friend says. A friend is somebody that loves his friend so much that he would dare to lay his life down, that he would become nothing so his friend could become everything. A friend is something that I wasn't. But now that I know God, and I'm God's friend, I'll be a friend. That's what I said. And 20 people out of 40 gave their life to Jesus that day. I mean, hardcore atheists and angry people, and even the angriest of angry people, were cut to the heart as this gospel is true. Listen, here's the deal. If you have not given yourself to Him completely, I want you to stand up right now. Please, I need you right now to obey this in your heart. If you have not given yourself completely to Jesus, I need you up right now. I don't need you up front. I just need you to stand up. Please don't play with this. There are people that are dying, man, every day. We can't afford to have those people in our hearts. There are people here that have not given themselves to Jesus. I need you to stand. Please. Yeah. There's this counselor and teen challenge. He, he would preach out of like Psalms 1. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? He called it stuck on stupid. But how long will you love your, your stuff until you realize that you need his? There are people out there in the back. People. You haven't given yourself to Him. I want you to please just surrender your life so that you don't have a Bobby in your life, man. Because there are people watching your life. He says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out. You know what that means? That means this. Hot is on fire. Cold is not knowing Him. But lukewarm is saying that you do, but have no fruit in your life that actually does. And you're a damage to the world around you. I said, God, that's crazy. Cold. Why would it be better to be cold? 
He said, because cold, they have no idea. Lukewarm, they say they do, but there's nothing in their life that bears witness of they do. Jesus, I need some music. Somebody play something. Sorry. It's a tense situation. I promise you this. This is the best thing you could ever do. Father, I worship you, God, and I thank you. Please forgive me for going too long. I'm sorry, Pastor Tom. I'm not. I just, man. Jesus, I worship you and I thank you. God, I thank you for even people that are here and are not wanting to stand because they're like over it. God, I thank you that they'd be so over themselves. God, I'm asking you to touch people with your Holy Spirit. Jesus! 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 God, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, God, to mark these people in here, God. Mark the ones that wouldn't stand. God, I'm asking you for an amazing marking of the heart, God. That you would bless them and overwhelm them with your gospel, God. God, I thank you for your presence, God. Your awesome, mighty King. We love you and we give you glory. God, I thank you for anybody that would say, you know what? I thought I did give myself. That they would say, you know what? Today I'm all in. <laughs> that they would say, I'm all in. Listen, if you're here and you did give yourself at one time, but you're backslidden, stand up. It's not okay to be backslidden. None. I don't care who you are. If you're here and you're in that place, stand up. Be humble and stand up right now. Please. I'm not looking at you like you're some kind of bad person. I'm saying it's time to get up. It's time to run. Life is short. Time is coming to an end. It's almost the end. The end was started when Jesus hung on that tree. We don't know when it is. It's sometime, but it's coming. You have a short opportunity. I want to pray for you to be empowered with this gospel. Empowered with the Holy Spirit. With the very power of heaven. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for great grace upon your people, God. I thank you, Father, that without even them speaking it out loud, and even the people that are sitting, God, I'm asking you, in the name of Jesus, God, that your presence would come. God, I thank you for a people that would run and not grow weary. God, I thank you for a people that would let their junk go and would dare to say yes to you, God. I thank you that you would empower this church, that you would empower the people that are here, God. That you would empower the island of Kauai to run with you. God, I thank you that this island would be known as a Christian island in Jesus' name. God, you've sent me here with purpose. And you told me three and a half years ago to come here. And you showed me waves, waves of God going out from this island. Father, I thank you that you didn't change the vision. It's the same. God, I thank you for an awakening of the body of Christ upon this island, God. The body of Christ on this island waking up, God.
in the yes. name of Jesus. I thank you for an active empowerment of your gospel. Yes, Lord. God, I thank you for people that would walk in the power of the gospel, that would walk Holy Spirit driven. Thank you, Jesus. That God, you would give them the authority of heaven on their lips. God, that they would hear people like you hear them. They would see people like you see them. That you would give them the strength and the courage to run, God. today, empowered with your gospel, God. That Holy Spirit, you would empower people with your presence. I thank you for encounters with you, God. In Jesus' name. That Holy Spirit, you would dare to allow us to believe the whole Bible, God. That we wouldn't tear out pages that we're uncomfortable with. That Holy Spirit, you would be our comfort because you're called the comforter. We thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Jesus' name, God. If you've got any kind of sickness or disease in your body right now, I want you to right now raise your hand. Please. I, it doesn't matter. Anything you're dealing with right now, raise your hand. I want people to gather around people with their hands raised. Come on, guys. Let's pray for some people. Let's do this. Please. If you don't believe this is true, you should have been up for the first call. Come on. Jesus, we thank you. Father, we thank you for sickness and disease being wiped out in the name of Jesus. God. Jesus' name. Come on, guys. Get to somebody that needs prayer. Please. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, God. guys help me pray we're not a healer but the Holy Spirit lives in us and he is Thank you in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you for this family, God, in Jesus' name. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. Great grace, God. Family that is overwhelmed with the gospel. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name, God. Thank you. Increase, God. Jesus' name, God. Thank you. God, I thank you that you bring it to pass right now. Jesus' name, God. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus name. I was made to love alive, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, you would take these cards and show doctors. You could put Baron Brandy Bone in God. In Jesus' name. God, thank you. Jesus' name. God, thank you. Great grace, God. Jesus. Jesus. God, thank you for no side effects, God, in the name of Jesus. No lingering effects, God. I thank you, Father. 
never gets to set off a metal machine. In Jesus' name. Well, thank you. I'm Brand new legs, God. Brand new. I'm alone. Jesus, thank you. Father, thank you in I'm Jesus' name. Lover. Great grace, God. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Jesus. I'm a lover. Jesus. I'm a lover. Thank you, God, for Holy Spirit. We just love you. you. Jesus' name.
25 minutes, we're going to be down at Kalapaki Bay, down by Cliffside, and we're going to baptize people. If you want to turn it around today, you want to give your heart over and make a public appearance of your faith, in 25 minutes at Kalapaki Bay, come down. We want to baptize you, welcome you to the family of God. Otherwise, God bless you. Continue to worship and pray. Yes, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, holy. Holy.
gave me new life You touched my heart, Lord You made me new again You are whole When you breathe new life When you breathe new breath Our spirit is awakened, Lord Hallelujah Hallelujah You are holy You By your word Your spirit falls on your people, Lord And we are blessed